Good morning, and if you'll indulge me, I just, because I think we're running a little ahead of schedule for a change, I want to just stand here and drink in this scene because I, maybe I had a bad margarita or something. Because I'm standing on a stage and my face is exposed and I'm seeing real people. This is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. I, I've been, right? And, and uh, three cheers to the, to the folks here for persevering. Man, I, I would have given up after New Orleans, which was like a year ago, but uh, they've, they've persevered and, and we're here to benefit from it. So uh, thank you so much. And if I can find my stuff, here we go. Um, okay, here we are. Okay, so, um, so what I'd like to do this morning is talk to you uh, a little bit about branding in general. I'm a marketing professor. I'm not a, definitely not a fashion designer, as you can tell. Uh, but I, I do a lot of work with customer-facing companies of all kinds, and, and the fashion business has been kind of a, uh, kind of a, uh, a love, or I might, guess you might say a fascination of mine for many, many years. I actually, believe it or not, did my doctoral dissertation on dress for success. Does anybody remember dress for success? Yeah, a few of the people who have hair my color are, are, remember dress for success. The gist of it is, if you look good, people think you're smart. But, uh, but anyway, there's been a lot of, of great work going on for many years about this, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some issues that we're all facing today. So let's, let's start with, uh, with a very quick recap of what's happened to the fashion industry over the last year and a half. Uh, and there, you know, there, there we go. Uh, with, with signs of life now, certainly, with definitely with signs of life, but man, has it been a year. I, you know, my various friends or colleagues who who work in fashion, uh, you know, I just feel bad for them. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a very, very hard time for, for, of course, for all of us, it has been a hard time. Um, what are some of the issues? Well, we have a reversal in our prior emphasis on globalization and globalization of supply chains and so on, maybe some nationalism coming in there. Obviously, lots of unstable politics, although a little more stable, perhaps, uh, over the last month or two, but, uh, but definitely a lot of stuff going on. Obviously, huge technological changes that everybody in marketing has, <clears throat> has to deal with. Uh, fear about the economy, and now maybe fear of inflation instead of recession, but you know, basically just fear. <laughs> you could take away the rest. It's just fear about the economy. And if, and of course, uh, possible, possibly a fashion backlash. You know, we were, we were seeing a lot of talk during the pandemic. A lot of, you know, a lot of times I would get calls, what's it gonna look like in the new normal? And I'm like, you know, I, I don't know. I, my guess is I think we're gonna see a return to elegance by about 20% of the population. Everybody else doesn't wanna give up their sweatpants that easily. So it's gonna be an interesting transition, that's for sure. Um, so we've had a lot of, we had the retail apocalypse, you may remember, and that was before COVID, by the way. Uh, so there's been problems for, for a number of years, and a lot of, of companies obviously have not, have not survived. Uh, what are the ways to, uh, to make sure that you're still around in 2022? Well, there, I don't have any magic bullets for you, but I do have some, some points or suggestions that in a way are so basic and so obvious that you'll wonder why I'm putting them up here, but it's always good to remind ourselves to kind of go back to Marketing 101. Uh, and by the way, I teach Marketing 101 and you guys are much more awake than, than those kids are, so that's good. But, but I've learned never teach a class before noon. I've learned that in 40 years of teaching. So, uh, Okay, re-engineer your marketing to show that you understand your customers. Show them that you understand them. Uh, fulfillment is a huge issue right now, obviously something to focus on. Um, allocate resources. I think our last speaker was sort of talking about allocating financial resources. Um, and address customer service because obviously uh, a lot of that got disrupted during the, during the pandemic as well. So it's easy for me to stand up here and lecture to you guys. Many of you have uh, are actually run successful fashion businesses, so who, who am I to tell you? Um, I understand that it's easier said than done. Um, 
But what I would like to do is, I, I, I do have a perspective uh, from the work that, that I do with companies on helping them to become more, more customer centric. And it, it's amazing to me, especially in, in the fashion industry, which frankly ought to know better. I think, uh, to be honest with you, the home, the home furnishings industry and the furniture industry are, are, are probably the only industry that's a little even less inclined to think about customer preferences. But, uh, but, and, and there are many, many exceptions. But we, what we really need is a better understanding of the customer. So uh, I, I, some of the points I'm making I actually took from a book I published last year with, uh, with Brandon Rowe. He is, the, he is the host of the fashion podcast um, that originates in, in Europe. And he and I got together and wrote this little book. And we, we talk about some of the earth-shaking disruptions in consumer behavior. And these are things that that I've been, been tracking. Uh, I write several textbooks on consumer behavior and marketing, and I constantly have to be you know, revising them. It's not like an algebra book that doesn't change in 300 years. Um, you know, if, you, if you publish a marketing book, you better, if you have any examples from 2018, your history. So it's very, very challenging. So over the years, I've had the opportunity to make, to make some observations about consumers and fashion and to work with some great companies and, uh, and, and do some fun things. But I'd like to start with a, with a story. Uh, actually, it goes back to uh, the earlier part of my career. Uh, I was working with a very large ad agency on Madison Avenue, and, and the client uh, was also a very large uh, personal care products company. Uh, still around today, very, you would know their name if I told you, but then I'd have to shoot you, so we don't want to do that. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, the, the particular brand we were working on was a, was a skincare product for women, and so I went around uh, and I talked to the client and the ad people and, and all that, and I said, tell me, who is your core customer? And, um, oh, there we go. And to a person, they told me the same story. Well, she's in her late 20s, early 30s, she's glamorous, she loves to go out at night, she owns about 8,000 pairs of shoes. Basically, they were describing Carrie on Sex in the City, if you, if you remember that. Um, and I said, that's, that's great, you know, that's a, that, everybody wants to have that customer, you know. But just for fun, I actually got a hold of some purchase data, and I, and I was able to find out who is really the core uh, purchaser for this particular brand. And it turned out to be a woman in her 50s who, who lives alone and has a lot of cats. Um, we, we call this the Blanche Dubois profile. And, and so the point is not that there's anything wrong with that, but what I learned very early in my career is that a lot of times in marketing, we think about the customer we want to have rather than the customer we actually have. Um, and there are many, uh, many stories, you know, the marketing graveyard is full of companies that kind of decided to go after a different customer. They didn't like their customer. You know, think about, I don't know, JCPenney going into fashion, for example, things like that. Uh, so what I learned is that empathy, understanding, putting yourself in the shoes of your customer is the single most valuable thing that you or you or you or I can do as a marketer, not just sitting there and imagining, I wonder if they would like this, or, or having a focus group or two and feeling like you've checked all the boxes. That really doesn't work. There's a lot of biases going on. There's a lot of, a lot of times it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We see what we want to see in the data, and that comes back to bite us later very often. So, um, what I, what I found is, and, and, and I don't know, I guess it's a coincidence that I came after an ROI speaker, because I'm, I'm talking about a very different kind of R, and your kind is super important. <laughs> uh, but the type I'm talking about is ROI, return on involvement. And this is a much, um, this is a, a much broader concept, and what it means is that, unfortunately, you guys often don't have the luxury of looking to the next quarter or beyond the next quarter, but that is where true customer relationships are made. Um, uh, you mentioned customer lifetime value. That's what this is about. It's about building a bond with a customer. But the problem is lifetime bonds aren't built in, in 15 minutes. You know, this is, this is something when you talk about the financial ROI, you've got to kind of be willing to suck it up for a while if you really want to have 
that kind of relationship where you can talk to your customers, understand them, and really become part of their lives and, and who they want to be. So, of course, what we want is we want people, women or men, to fall in love with fashion again. I guess a lot of people kind of fell in love, to, out of love, temporarily at least, with fashion. And, and as with all kinds of consumer products, what I found is that the holy grail is engagement. And if you have a really excited customer, you don't have to sell anything to them because they want what you have. I mean, the famous, very famous uh, management theorist, Peter Drucker, once said, the goal of marketing is to make selling superfluous. Think about that. Why would I have to sell you something that where I've, I've made something that you actually, you're begging me to, to have it, I don't have to sell it to you. So maybe my marketing costs go down if I make a great product. So consumer engagement is really at the heart of many of the issues we're facing in marketing right now. When we look at customer experience, which I'll talk about, I'm actually doing another t uh, keynote tomorrow on artificial intelligence, I'll talk about that. Uh, but really getting customers engaged, my, one of my favorite cartoons, is, you know, reality TV, boy, there's nothing more engaging than reality TV, even if it's the opposite of reality. Uh, it, if we could get our customers as engaged as they are in you know, some of these reality shows, we, we'd all go to Las Vegas and walk around and gamble. I don't know what we would do. Um, I'm, having a, I'm having a glitch, is that possible? Indeed. Mr. Techman, oh, there we go, thank you. These guys are great. Right? So as we look, if I can get a little academic on you for, for a minute, um, our, our last speaker confessed that she's a nerd. Well, I'm a, I'm a professor, so I was born to be a nerd. Um, we've seen over the past 20 years or so this, this transformation in, in how we're looking at brands and customers' relationships with brands. And basically, some of the things we've seen is that the, in the traditional view that many of you, especially if you, you, know, if you went to business school, you learn that a brand is an asset, a financial asset, that is created and controlled by the firm. Um, uh, that is actually no, no longer the case uh, very often. Brands are co-created entities, and it's important for you to recognize this. A brand is a living thing, in a sense. It's an idea that exists both in your mind and my mind. You as the manufacturer, perhaps, me as the consumer, and jointly, we decide what that brand's gonna mean. And that is particularly true today in the, in the day of Internet 2.0, where everybody and his brother is entitled to share their opinion about what's wrong with a product and so on. Uh, brands exist in the minds of consumers. It's an individual idea, something that I learned. You know, I learned early on that I like Coca-Cola. Um, not necessarily, brands live in cultures. And what we find that a lot of brands, the meaning of the brand is growing out of what's happening in a culture at a particular point in time. And if, if you're a student of history, you can look back and understand how, when you look at, for example, uh, clothing styles at different eras in, in our history, you'll see how they aligned with various uh, kind of macro issues that were going on in the environment, whether it's, it was women's rights or sexuality or you know, whatever the issues were. Um, a focus on what brands mean, that is a very kind of, you know, in, I, I hate to say, I'm a psychologist, I'm allowed to say this, it's a very anal fixation on measuring the very specific attributes of brands. That actually is not uh, very often as, as valuable as, well, I've got a temperamental guy here. Well, I spoke too soon before because this guy still isn't working. Um, oh, and there it goes, it's got the life of its own. Anyway, a focus from what brands mean to how brands come to mean, that is, a brand is a story that evolves over time in the same way that you and I have stories, our lives that evolve over time. So this more longitudinal perspective 
can be very, very valuable, uh, especially for brands that are starting out and are still trying to establish an identity. So to give you a quick example of what I mean by fashion co-creation, you all know this brand, Timberland. This is a white bread brand. You know, this is about uh, Caucasian people going hiking, right? I mean, that, it, it's done a great job over the years of building that identity and telling that story. However, an interesting thing happened some time ago because members of a totally different market segment decided to co-opt or, or you might say participate in changing the meaning of this very white bread brand. And, and some of you uh, know the next slide I'm, I'm going to put up because what, what happened is that Timberland also became an icon of hip hop style a very, very different uh, segment. And what's happening here is that you have individual consumers who are starting with a brand meaning and now they are taking that as their starting point, but now they're going to build on it. And so uh, you, you've, we've seen this with other brands like Tennis Whites, for example, that people wear on the subway in New York. It's kind of an ironic statement, like I'm never gonna get to a country club in my life, but I'm gonna wear these, these clothes. So, we see this happening a lot, and, and a lot of fashion brands, you may or may not like what customers do, but they're definitely going to do things to your brand. So when we think about building a brand or maintaining an already powerful brand, we, we, it's so important to think about what I call brand resonance, brand resonance. And that, and that means the extent to which a brand really locks into who you are it tells something about you know, who I am, maybe who I want to be, but I'm working on this project, this identity for myself, and this brand is really, really important to me. Now, if you can achieve that, you, are, you, know, you, you, you can retire because you know, very few brands are able to truly achieve brand resonance. If I asked you for some examples, however, you could probably give them to me quite quickly. You know, there's the usual obvious ones like Apple, Nike, Under Armour, Lululemon, et cetera. This is a test because I, I was so happy about standing in front of live people and now I can't talk to them. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of different routes to building resonance and, 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 and different brands have to do it different ways. Um, uh, we've identified a number of these. I'm, I won't go through them all this morning. You can be relieved to hear that. But for example, personal co-creation. I already mentioned co-creation. Does my brand encourage consumers to create their own stories about how the brand has affected their lives? Uh, for a number of years, I, I did a lot of work for Levi Strauss on the psychology of blue jeans, which was a lot of fun. I had the opportunity to go to their headquarters in San Francisco and actually read uh, an archive of letters that they keep and, and packages that consumers have sent to the company over the last 150 years. And reading some of these letters, it's amazing how many of them are writing to thank the company for giving them a companion that has lasted for so many years. Uh, in one case, and I was told this is not uncommon, there was a box with a pair of uh, old ragged pair of what was left of a pair of Levi's jeans after they'd been made into cutoffs and then parts were cut out into a, uh, uh, for quilts because apparently a lot of people feel their Levi's are so important to them they want to pass them down to their grandchildren. And there was a note that said, I find, I've had these jeans for 45 years, I can no longer keep them, please make sure they get a proper burial. So they sent them home to be, to be buried in San Francisco. I'm not making that up. Uh, another, another example is intimacy. Intimacy. Uh, do, my, do my customers know the inside details, you know, the inside stories about the brand? And that helps to, you know, make people really, uh, it, it's fun for them to follow brands that way. And so Air Jordans have, have that kind of, uh, kind of thing going on. Uh, there's a number of others. If, if you're interested, if you want to go to my website, uh, you can download for free. It's a, uh, an audit that kind of gives a list of about, uh, I forget, about 12 or 13 different paths to, to brand resonance that you might consider. Just go to uh, michaelsolomon.com and, and you'll see it there. Okay, 
There are two kinds of people in the world. People who think there are two kinds of people and people who don't. Um, I'm, in the, I'm in the latter, but um, d don't freak out. I'm not going to get into a, uh, you know, a complicated lecture here, but I will tell you that the way we think about our businesses is a reflection of the way many of us scientists, social scientists, et cetera, have been trained to think about the world. And that is in what we call the positivist tradition. And, and basically, if, if you're into architecture, you heard of modernism versus postmodernism. Basically, positivism, which is at the root of the scientific method, very important to us to understand what causes what as opposed to you know, what merely happens when something else happens, et cetera. But what it means is that we love to put things into very, into very well-defined specific categories. And when we do so, we think that we've understood them. So we love to put, as we'll see, our customers into these very, very specific uh, categories. And, and if you look around the management or marketing literature, you'll see so many different examples of various models that are you know, quadrants, and you're in the upper left, and I'm in the lower right, so we can't go out tonight, I don't know. Uh, you know lots of different, of different thinking that basically puts people into little buckets, right? Maybe even in, in the fashion world. Uh, there's a lot of interesting ramifications uh, for market segmentation about this. I'll actually talk more about this tomorrow. Uh, but basically, we do the same thing when we segment our customers. We have categories like income and geography and age and gender and you know, race and ethnicity and all those things. Uh, the fashion industry, of course, does the same thing, at least traditionally. Yeah, people love to talk about seasons and, and, and things like that. That's kind of, seasons are kind of going away after the pandemic. We'll see what happens. But the reality is that things that happen in a category don't stay in a category, like kind of like Vegas, right? Um, there are lots of things that happen in one category influence, <coughs> influence things that happen in other categories. So we have, in the fashion world, we see that things that are going on here might influence the design of a totally unrelated uh, garment or accessory or, or anything else, right? Um, and we know, again, as I said, that, that, that fashion is very much a reflection of what's going on in the broader society, good things, bad things, anxieties people have. Uh, way, back, uh, way back in the late 50s, Russia launched a, a satellite. Some of you read in your history books about Sputnik. Uh, people in the U.S. were absolutely freaked out because this was the Cold War and it meant that the, you know, the Soviets were going to get the, an advantage and shoot bombs at us from the moon or something like that. And so, of course, as you, as you probably know, in the early 60s here in the U.S., we had this tremendous focus uh, fostered by President Kennedy on going to space and rockets and all that. And you can see how that was reflected, for example, in the car designs with those cool, huge fins that come out. That was a direct result of the, of the space race, which had nothing to do with automobiles, of course. So today, we live in an era that we call postmodernism. So modernism is all about putting people in, into categories, uh, uh, understanding, trying to understand the world by making typologies and classifications, et cetera. Postmodernism is about the, the uh, elimination of boundaries, putting things together that otherwise wouldn't go, wouldn't go together, like merging different lifestyles, for example. So here we have, this is great, so here we have, based on his appearance, you know, he's kind of a button-down guy, maybe he's Maybe he works you know, in, in finance or something like that. It's a stereotype, I get it. Uh, but here he is, sneaking away on his lunch hour, and he's getting this great ink from this guy, which of course he can cover up with his sleeve, right? So what we have here is, is a consumer who's, who's into, in a lifestyle category, you know, successful executive, whatever you want to call it, but he's experimenting with another. And, and I submit to you that this picture is very representative of the way many of us are living our lives today in that we're dipping our toe in and out of a lot of different categories that prior to the last 20 years or so, 
we really didn't know very much about. Then this internet thing came along. I still think it might be a fad, but it looks like it's going to hold on for a while. So the way we categorize products, in addition to how we categorize people, is super important, even though we don't think about it that much. So I could ask you this profound question. What is a watch? Like, that's, that's something, you know, that the answer's obvious, right? Or is it, you know? Well, a watch can be a, a piece of jewelry. It's ornamental, it can be beautiful, it can be incredibly expensive, et cetera. Uh, a watch can also be a tool, right? Uh, you know, wearable computing, obviously a huge deal. We'll have some, I think, some talks at this conference about that. Well, is that a trivial question? It, it is if you just like to wear a watch, but if you're, what if you're a merchandiser, you know? Uh, where do you put those watches, you know, especially wearables? Where do you put them? You know, do you put them, in, do you put them in the exercise wellness section if there is such a thing, or do you put it in with fine jewelry? And, and I've talked to retailers who have had this quandary, you know, especially with computer wearables, because it's a new category and people don't quite know how to organize their, their lives around it. But what I submit to you, and again, tomorrow much more detail on this, is that when we put people in categories, we block the path to resonance. That is, we're, we're not exploring all the ways that we might create a brand that is really attaching itself, ooh, I shouldn't have done that, is really attaching itself to people. So we, we want to actually try to revise our thinking to, if you will, look beyond the box. I know that's a cliche, don't think inside the box, but it really is a problem when you just think inside your little category and you think about only your immediate competitors and something else comes along and ambushes you because you, you weren't thinking about it, right? So here's an example from the fashion industry, categories that we use, right? So we have athletic wear, that's been around for a long, long time, kind of a blah category, not terrible, but not doing great. We have another category called leisure wear, same story, kind of plodding along. But then what happens? We start to have some big shifts in our culture about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, let's call it the wellness invasion, right? And suddenly lots of people are starting to revise their values around wellness and exercise and, and eating junk food or whatever. And so there's this huge, uh, this movement that is starting, and a few people uh, saw this, one of whom was the, happened to be the founder of Lululemon, um, a consultant client of mine, uh, disclaimer. Um, and they said, you know what, let's make a new category. I don't have to be either this or that. Let's create this new category, which takes elements, design elements from those other two, combines them together. And you guys know the rest of the story. Half of you are probably wearing athleisure here uh, while you're listening to me. It's an incredibly you know, successful category. So what I want to do in, in the time that I, that I have is to run through uh, some other obsolete categories and, and hopefully get you to think about how you might uh, go outside of the box a little bit. The first is me versus we. That somehow what goes on in here is a different phenomenon than what goes on out there. So back in, in my day, when I, when I was young, um, in uh, 2010 or so, <laughs> no. um, you know, we used to say, do your own thing. So there was a focus on individuality, whether we practice that or not, we could, we could argue that. Um, but today, it's a, much more, it's a much different story, right? Uh, you know, I have, I've had students tell me on more than one occasion, I didn't know that my boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with me until I read about it on Facebook, you know? Um, so we've become much more public, for better or worse, big ethical issues about sharing data and so on, but the, the position is, I am who I am, but I want to share that with you now, and I'm going to share it ad nauseum on Instagram and, and, and so on. Um, now, that it, it creates uh, a very, very interesting issue because for 50 years or so, we've taught students that there's a linear buying sequence that we can pretty much count on for many or most purchases. And in other words, things go through a series of steps, uh, kind of like the framework you, you were talking about, I guess. I don't have seven, I have five. 
The first is problem recognition. This is just a classic. This is what we teach all the time, trust me. Uh, understanding that there's some gap between you know, where you are now and where you want to be. Figuring out where can I get uh, solutions to that problem. Of course, that's why we have this thing called Google today. Evaluating the alternatives that I've come up with. Debating the pros and cons of each because everything has pros and, and cons. Uh, making the purchase and then deciding whether it was a good idea. That's the classic linear buying decision sequence. Throw it out the window, folks. It ain't working today because, because what we have today is an always-on buying process, always-on. Um, and, and what we see is that people are basically 24-7, we're getting suggestions about what to buy, we're asking our networks about what to buy, and so on. Um, and so there's a lot of, of interest now in what Google calls the ZMOD, if you can see there, zero moment of truth. That moment when the consumer actually commits to the purchase. And, and basically what Google finds, much to its delight, I'm sure, is that the zero moment of truth occurs actually much later in the process than it used to. <clears throat> because for even routine decisions, especially young people, will not make that decision until they get feedback from their, from their buds, from their BFFs. So they're likely, rather than to say, you know, where should I, should I go to lunch down the street? They're likely to go to Yelp and then go to here, go to there. We actually do a lot more work in the internet age than we used to do in terms of researching the, um, you know, the various options. That's why YouTube, by the way, good trivia question, it, we know that Google is the first, is the world's largest search engine. YouTube is the second largest search engine. So consumers are using YouTube to search for suggestions about what to buy from your company. Um, and so obviously, I don't have to tell you this, social media has a huge impact on what we do today. Uh, we interviewed some consumers for this book of all ages. And so here's a, here's a woman age 29, and you know, she says, my social media friends are the first place I look for outfit inspiration. Um, and, and so clearly people are kind of tuning into this, uh, you know, into cyberspace, what's going on out there. Um, and what's happening as a result, I think, is that we've, we're moving from the era of me, like in the 80s, self-absorbed me, to the era of we. Uh, we crowdsource ideas, fashion companies, some of them do this very, very successfully. Here's that ZMOT, that, this is, I stole this from Google. Um, uh, you can see that there's lots and, 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 and lots of activity that's going on well before the customer ever hits the store shelf. So if you're in retailing and you think your, your, your customer's gonna walk in the door and you can sell them something, they're probably coming in already knowing what they're gonna buy, they're just looking for the best deal. So you've gotta get started much, much earlier in the process if you're gonna have any hope of, of influencing these, these people. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and, and again, there's this kind of, I'll, I'll do it now, I'll check with my friends, if they don't like it, I'll return it because they sent me you know, eight, eight box, uh, postage paid boxes to return everything. So what we see is that consumers are tremendously engaged in sharing it's not enough to, you know, to like what you buy. Everybody's got to know that you like what you buy. Does anybody know what haul videos are? Has anybody ever seen a haul video? Check it out on, on YouTube after I'm done, please. H-A-U-L videos, it's a whole genre. You'll find hundreds, maybe thousands of them. They're usually younger girls uh, who have gone on a shopping expedition, uh, the Gap, or wherever they went. They come home, they go up to their bedroom, and of course, it doesn't count unless you filmed it. So at, what they're doing is they're taking each item out of the bag and they're holding it up and they're going, oh, this, here's this amazing blouse I just bought. You know, I think it really looks good on me, you know, whatever. And they just do, that's a whole video. And so if you don't believe me, you can, uh, you can Google, Google that. Pretty common, actually. So what we have is a new a moment of truth, uh, uh, as uh, Google likes to talk about, where we have a lot of activity going on, some of it involving technology that's just starting to surface, where it's possible to simulate 
the experience that many of us used to have. Do you remember in the old days you would actually go shopping with friends at a mall and you would stay there for the afternoon? It's hard to, it's hard to remember, but, but that used to be a lot of fun for a lot of people. You have lunch, you do this, right? Uh, well, today what we can do with all the online you know, migration that we're seeing is it is possible to simulate that shopping experience of uh, trying some things on to see how they look on your body digitally, uh, pretend uh, or uh, involving three or four of your friends who are going with you, so to speak, as you move to these stores. That is the new digital group shopping experience. Very, very important, I think, um, uh, as we go into the next five or 10 years. So we're accessing feedback before we buy rather than afterwards. Uh, so this, this woman here, uh, age 21, she says, first I'll search in different apps to get product information, then I'll ask my friends whether they use it. If I think it's suitable for me, I'll look at reviews, and then I start to look at prices. Um, and only then, uh, you know, if it's too expensive, I'll go to the physical stores and try it, and then I'll probably go online and buy it. Don't you hate that, right? Showrooming. So this is kind of where we're going. This is an app, I'm not sure if it's still active, but what you do is, let's say you got a hot date on Saturday night. You take a picture of yourself in the outfit that you're planning to wear, you post it, and your network votes on whether it looks good or not. So you're dressing by committee. You're literally dressing by committee. Think about that. It's just like industrial buying, where you have a, a buying center groups of people weighing in on these decisions. Huge change in the, in the way we do things. Part of the problem is that we just have way too many choices, as you all know. You know, ladies, if you go, you know, to get a red lipstick, is there such a thing? No, there's like a thousand shades of red lipstick, you know, uh, a tie or something else, the same thing. Um, and this has led us to a condition that we call hyper choice, which means that that actually, and there's, you know, there's a lot of research that backs this up, the paradox is that we think by giving our customers more choices, they'll like us more. The reality is that's true up to a point, but after that, they get so overwhelmed, they either throw up their hands and leave, or they're more likely to just say, just pick one for me. There's 100 here, I, ju I just can't. I just can't, you know, the 100 brands of breakfast cereal here, I just can't do it. Which, of course, in fashion is why this notion of a curator is so important. And this is a person somewhere in the system who is a gatekeeper, who is filtering out, you know, a thousand options to a more manageable 10 or so. So we have these people called fashion bloggers you've all heard of. Some of you may be fashion bloggers. You're curators, and that's what you're doing is you're trying to alleviate hyper choice. Okay, the second one I want to talk about this morning, moving very quickly, consumers versus producers. Fascinating. This, these two categories have largely merged together. It's really interesting. So particularly in fashion, of course, we have a lot of user-generated content, but in advertising as well. Many of you remember the Dorito Super Bowl challenge, right? For 10 years in a row, uh, they had, you know, ordinary people making a Super Bowl commercial, often with a budget of under $100, shot in a basement. And for every one of those years, that homemade ad was one of the most successful and most remembered ads on the Super Bowl. So you've got a lot of professional ad people on Madison Avenue not real happy about that. But that is the way that, that things are going. Uh, this was a campaign that Burberry did some years ago, Art of the Trench, one of the first crowdsourcing advertising campaigns in fashion, where basically if you owned a Burberry trench coat, you took a picture of yourself wearing it, you posted it, and then you got to see you know, how everybody else wore their coat as well. Very, very successful campaign for Burberry. Um, here we have Etsy, right? Everyday people who are becoming business people. This is the probably one of the biggest stories of the, of the decade, other than the pandemic, the gig economy, Ordinary people, you know, driving cabs, renting out their homes, making and selling jewelry. Uh, maybe they're selling Mary Kay or Avon, but they are taking on the roles of professionals in ways that we've never seen before. Now, there's a downside to this because when, what we know that when people take control and get involved 
in a purchase. We actually call it the IKEA effect, which means that if you participate in building something or creating something, you like it more when it's done because it's, it's part of what you did. Now, I always have a few pieces left over. I don't know who's, who's they belong to, but you know what I'm saying. Some of you, you know, every time you walk by that bookcase, it's not just a bookcase. It's, oh yeah, I made that one. That, that afternoon sucked. You know, I just made that, that bookcase, but now it's mine. So that builds engagement, but of course, when you give the keys uh, of the asylum to the inmates, they're going to cause some problems, and this, is, this has been a major issue. So consumers are very creative. These are all examples of uh, digital assets that consumer, you know, everyday people have gone in and, you know, played around with, and I, I think in some very creative ways. I don't know if, uh, you know, Ford and Nokia and all these others would be that happy with it, but you know what? The lesson is, remember what I said about co-creation, you don't own your brand anymore. Get over it, right? I don't think the person who designed this cigarette lighter ever thought it was going to be a piece of mouth jewelry, whatever they call it, but it is. So, you know what? There's not much you can do about it. The genie's out of the bottle. Okay, the third one, fascinating, I think. The body versus things that I own. You know, obviously, yeah, I have my physical body, and then, you know, I buy a jacket that put it on my body, you know. Uh, but that is largely going away. Uh, so, for example, you see some companies that are actually using their customers as ads. Uh, you were talking about customer advocacy, you know, the, the, your, true, your brand evangelists. Uh, you know, here we have people who are renting out their bodies. This is for real. Uh, you know, uh, put a tattoo of your logo here and, you know, for $100, I'll, I'm your boy. Um, and so you have this literal merging of the body and advertising in, in this case. Here's something they're doing in Japan right now. So, you know, raise your hand if you're sure. Um, lots of other ways that, that technology is getting integrated into our physical selves. So, for example, smart contact lenses. Yes, they can make you see better, but uh, in this case, they're all for diabetics, they're going to monitor levels of blood sugar. So they're doing more than one function, just like those computer wearables I was talking about before. Uh, here we have a, a product, I actually was involved uh, uh, in working on part of this. Um, it turns out that, uh, that by the way, when you, uh, when you, there's a certain substance that when you apply it to the skin, it removes cellulite. Anybody interested in knowing what it is? It's an everyday substance, caffeine, caffeine. And so what, so what some companies have done is they've created panty, it's possible to take a product like, let's say, pantyhose and turn it into a delivery platform because what you do is, it's called micro-encapsulation where what you don't see are lots of little tiny kind of bubble, you know how you get those bubble, the bubble wrap you like to burst? Little, little tiny bubbles that as the, as the skin, uh, you know, brushes against, it opens those bubbles and it releases something into the skin. So, it could be a vitamin, it could be a, you know, it could be a medication. In this case, it's caffeine. And so, again, you have a, a product that's been around for many years. I'm not sure how many women still wear pantyhose, but, but the point is that it's relatively easy to make, to turn a fashion product into a delivery system where it's doing more than one job at a time. Uh, wearable computing, again, this is a prototype for a, a hoodie that you wear and the way that it vibrates, different vibration patterns, tell you who on your phone is calling because it's linked to your phone. So you can answer your hoodie. Um, so very quickly, just a few other out outdated categories that I think are relevant to fashion, just to get you to think about this a, a little bit more. Digital beauty versus real. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing that, that digitized models are being, uh, making a sensation online. This woman is not real. Um, you know, she, she is an animation. And so you have, some of you are familiar with, with, with a few of the, uh, you know, like Michaela, some of these other uh, internet celebrities that actually don't exist because they're digital creations. Buying versus gifting, right? So in, in retail, we love, we love the gifting season, right? We love the holiday season. 
Well, it turns out that increasingly what we find is that when people, it's not that they're no longer buying gifts for others, but they're over the years becoming more likely to also buy for themselves while they're at it. They say, well, as long as I'm here, I've been pretty good. I deserve a gift. And so when you think about gifting in retail, uh, what we call self-gifting, you deserve a break today, as McDonald's says. That is a different purchase motivation than we've seen in the past. Owning versus renting, oh my God. My, I have, uh, one of my daughters is 32. Uh, she works in, or did work in Manhattan. She works for Pinterest now, out of her home. Um, she told me that, that about two out of every three days when she was going to the office in Manhattan, she was wearing clothing rented from uh, Rent the Runway. She wasn't buying her own, and believe me, this girl can buy clothes. Um, she was renting, and that, that is becoming increasingly popular. And of course, uh, something else is, this, is secondhand clothing, which as we know, you know, when Macy's opens pop-up shops in its stores to sell secondhand clothing, you know that there's a big change afoot. Indulgence versus investment. Oh, fashion is all about beauty. It's not about making money, things like that. Boy, has that changed in the last few years. Uh, we have, for example, if you're familiar with StockX, you can go on these stock markets. You can buy shares in vintage sneakers. You can buy shares in designer handbags. And you can buy and sell those shares. So increasingly, people are, are viewing expensive designer clothing not just as a frivolous thing that they like to peek at in the closet, but actually as a financial investment and monitoring it that way. Male versus female, it doesn't get more basic than this. But here in 2021, we know that in many parts of the world, including the US, conversations about this binary classification are just everywhere, right? And we don't even designate any more male, female on a conference registration. Now we get to say, you know, what, whatever we are. Facebook has something like 60 de designations for gender. So that old distinction, I either sell to, you know, men's clothing or women's clothing, for example, that really needs to be rethought and it's got great potential because maybe you can actually double your, your, your market size if you start selling to the other gender, right? Uh, so we have, uh, we have here uh, bracelets for, for men, that's, you know, that's a whole new category for men pretty much, man bags, um, I, I have one, everybody gives me a lot of crap about it, I don't care. Because it, you know, women had, women understood this for years, it's nice to have a bag like that. You know, so all kinds of, of things like that going on, uh, and, and obviously the models themselves, the androgyny of fashion, et cetera, some really, really interesting things happening, new startups like Me Undies that have started, you know, their DNA is androgyny, they don't make men's underwear, they don't make women's underwear, they make underwear. Experts versus peers. Now this one, you know, as a professor, people say, you know, I, I had a student say to me, you know, you professors think you know so much. Yeah, we do. Um, you know, experts versus peers and all the different influencers, you know, and of course we, we talk about the erosion of, cre of expertise at the higher, traditional levels like the editors of Vogue and Cosmo and Women's Wear Daily and so on, no longer having nearly the amount of influence as they used to because they've been supplanted by your BFFs who just think they know more about fashion or fashion bloggers who do know more about fashion. But that these demarcations among these various categories, uh, nobody quite knows what's going to happen to this. But when you're in a business like marketing that's based on peer-to-peer -peer communications, it sure is helpful to get a, uh, more of a handle on, on this. Online versus offline. Uh, are, you know, if I'm, in a, if I'm in a bricks and mortar store, you know, do I go into online or vice versa? No longer a decision. All retail needs to be omni-channel. It needs to be simultaneously online and offline because your customers are simultaneously online and offline, just like many of you guys who are peeking down at your Facebook right now you're, you're, and trying to listen to me, you're online and, don't worry, my students do it all the time. Uh, you're online and offline at the same time. So why am I thinking about a store that doesn't have any technology in it, you know? 
So for example, smart mirrors that, that really revolutionized with augmented reality the way that people try on clothing, upselling of accessories and so on, the sky's the limit there. So, and, and in the online world, by the way, digital fashion is, is a huge thing. You know, there's thousands of aspiring young designers who don't have the capital to open bricks and mortar um, are opening businesses online because they're, they're making digital designs, attracting a following, and then perhaps going into bricks and mortar. So that's what I've got. I, uh, I hope I'm on time. Once again, it's so wonderful to be standing and looking at you all. Thank you very much. I don't, do, I have a, do I have time for questions, or I'm happy to take them? Oh, so we're done. Even better. Thank you all.